To best grasp the political determinants of health, let's examine a hypothetical example that combines experiences of real people in urban and rural communities. Imagine a 19-year-old woman, we'll call her Jessica. After enduring several miscarriages, she barely survives giving birth to an infant nine weeks early, the baby weighing only three pounds. Her son is placed in the neonatal intensive care unit, the blood from his umbilical cord revealing over 200 toxins. Where did the system fail Jessica and her baby? How and why did these results occur? Three years earlier, Jessica had left her parents' house. Access to treatment for her dad's substance use disorder had been eliminated when policymakers closed three of the city's public community health centers to save money. Contending with his wife's lack of education, neither of Jessica's parents could secure a job with a livable wage, prompting serious and substantial mental health conditions. Jessica moved to a low-income neighborhood in the city. She never knew of the extent of how the appalling conditions of her neighborhood were politically determined. For example, determined to keep housing segregation in place, politicians expended very few resources to build sidewalks, parks, or recreational facilities. Healthcare providers refused to operate in Jessica's community due to poor reimbursement rates for Medicaid. Because they resisted creating bus routes, lawmakers dissuaded grocery stores from operating in the community, preventing residents' access to fresh fruit, vegetables, and meat. Simultaneously, policymakers altered zoning laws to permit development of a dump site and a chemical plant, switching the community's water source from a clean river 10 miles away to a nearby polluted river to save money. This water was used to drink, bathe, and wash clothes. It also irrigated the lawn at Jessica's apartment building, adding to the list of pollutants and environmental hazards in her neighborhood. And because her district lacked established tenant rights, her landlord had no interest in improving unhealthy housing practices. Jessica found work as a cashier at the corner convenience store, a job with no employee benefits, including health or disability insurance. Because policymakers rejected proposals to increase minimum wage to a livable income, Jessica often substituted her employer's free snacks policy as a meal, never realizing the effect that high-fat, high-sodium food would eventually have on her or her baby's health. With local politicians striking down an effort to ban smoking in convenience stores, Jessica was constantly subjected to a barrage <coughs> of secondhand smoke. And when she discovered she was pregnant, no attempt at receiving health insurance coverage was successful. Her non-ACA-compliant plan denied her maternity coverage because they viewed her pregnancy as a pre-existing condition. Medicaid, the government's health insurance program for low-income families, denied her coverage for not being poor enough. After finding a ride to the free clinic, Jessica waited more than half a day to be seen by a second-rate physician, a doctor who was condescending and offensive. Realizing she could not afford to take more days off from work, she never went back. At 31 weeks, a neighbor drove Jessica to a hospital ER 20 miles away. Seeing that Jessica was experiencing excessive swelling in her face and ankles, as well as seizures, the emergency team decided to deliver her premature son immediately. Due to complications, her newborn son was sent to the neonatal intensive care unit. Once his organs were deemed mature enough, he was taken off the machines and sent home with severe cognitive defects. And in their apartment, Jessica and the baby were exposed to mildew and cockroaches, causing her son to develop respiratory problems. The landlord refused to remedy the poor conditions, telling her to move if she didn't like it there. Jessica struggled to find early childhood care and access to schools with educational assistance, healthy food options, and other resources needed to thrive. Because their school and community lacked the resources to enable Jessica's son to even barely reach his potential, he dropped out of school after entering eighth grade, just as his grandmother had done, repeating what is surely the ongoing rule of poverty. Jessica's story shows the compounding effect of political determinants over personal responsibility. No matter how reliably Jessica tried to act, structural, institutional, intrapersonal, and interpersonal obstacles stood in her way. 
political determinants were pulling strings that prevented Jessica and her family from achieving optimal health and their full potential. What does this mean for all of us? What can we do to improve and mend our community's most damaged systems?